Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle has cited my video credits, and my, I'm afraid it's all too true. When you live as long as I do, you start appearing on television from time to time. And actually, I think producers like it that way uh, because you start blurring the distinction between um, commentator and eyewitness. <laughs> you see somebody and you think, uh, Alford, Alford, yes, I've seen him before somewhere. Wasn't he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't he in the McKinley administration, I think? Uh, <laughs> When I started uh, researching Booth's life uh, years ago, a friend said, why are, you, why are you working on Booth? Booth did a terrible thing. Booth was, uh, did a, uh, Booth was bad. Uh, why are you researching bad? Why don't you work on Lincoln? You know, Lincoln was good. Lincoln did a good thing. So why, why are you working on bad? You should be working on good. And I thought, well, you know, I should think about that. Bad, good, you know. Uh, but I stayed with Booth because of an insight that William Faulkner had once. Faulkner wrote that virtue was a wonderful thing, that it was the very best thing. Uh, as Faulkner wrote, however, the rewards of virtue can be cold, colorless, and uh, tasteless, and as he phrased it, not to be compared to the bright and exciting pleasures of sin and wrongdoing. <laughs> so I stuck with Booth and have been contentedly working along that way. Um, Michelle mentioned the biography, and it's going to be divided into the, you know, the standard four parts of a person's life. The, you, you, know, the, you know the four parts, right, of a person's life. Uh, phase one, you believe in Santa Claus. Phase two, you no longer believe in Santa Claus. Phase three, you are Santa Claus. <laughs> Phase four, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> That puts me in mind of the, uh, of the student who, who uh, is said to have, when asked on an exam, who was Joan of Arc, uh, wrote down, uh, Noah's oldest daughter. <laughs> or the other student who said that Lincoln signed the Emasculation Proclamation. <laughs> then that student went on to explain that uh, that was very painful for many people, very painful. <laughs> Yeah, you would want to write in the margin, yeah, tell me about it. Then you write, no, don't tell me about it, please. Uh, it may seem odd that as a Booth person, I'm on the board of the Lincoln Institute, uh, but as you know, every picnic must have an ant. So, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm accepted in that regard. Uh, it's true at board meetings, I am required to sit at the far end of the table. <laughs> It also seems true that I don't hear about board social events until the day after they occur. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm not treated bad. I'm not badly. I'm not treated as a Judas. I'm not in the situation of poor old Father Tim. You may have uh, recalled the story of Father Tim. Let me share it uh, for those who haven't. Father Tim was a parish priest in the north of Ireland back during the days of the Troubles. And the cardinal called him in one day and said, Father Tim, I don't believe this. I just don't believe this. You've been preaching politics again. Now, I have told you a hundred times, these are troubled days here in the north of Ireland, and we need uh, peace and compassion and reconciliation and brotherly love, and I, I just don't believe you keep going on politics. So listen to me very careful, Father. From now on, when you preach, do not mention England. Do not mention the English. In fact, don't even say the word England. Don't say the word English. Do you understand me? This is your last warning. I mean, if, you, if we have one more incident with you, Father, the next parish that you'll be uh, sharing, having, you'll be sharing with Father Damien in that leper colony in Hawaii. Well, Father Tim said, yes, Your Eminence. Well, wouldn't you know it, the very next Sunday, Father Tim had to give a sermon on the Last Supper. And it went something like this. Father Tim said that, after Jesus and the disciples had finished a hearty meal of bangers and mash, Jesus turned, Jesus turned to the disciples and he said, Tonight, one of you will betray me. Shock, consternation, fear. Finally, Peter said, Lord, is it me? Jesus said, No, it's not you, Peter. Luke said, Lord, is it me? Jesus said, No, it's not you, Luke. Matthew said, Lord, is it me? Jesus said, no, it's not you, Matthew. From the end of the table, Judas Iscariot said, it ain't, it ain't me, is it, governor?
But uh, we know that. We hear from Father Tim from time to time. The uh, Pacific Mail steamer from the Sandwich Islands gets in with letters about, you know, twice, twice a month. About to, on average, twice a month. Yeah. Um, John Wilkes Booth's young friend, William Ferguson, who shared the stage with him in Washington, wrote, Pictures of Booth in the main disclose him as Saturn or melancholy. They show little of his quick excitability, nothing of his love of fun, no trace of his joyousness. He did odd things, but they were accepted as, without analysis as part and parcel of the way that he was. His verve and fire as an actor made him stand high in my esteem and everyone else's. He had a love of fun, of a rather rough sort, a roguery, a dash. Practical jokes of his invention were very clever. And for these qualities, which completely conceal from us the dark side of his character, I held him in admiration and high esteem. In 1863, when Ferguson met Booth, the actor was well established as a star. His acting career had begun six years earlier in 1857, when Booth did a year as an apprentice actor at the Arch Street Theater in Philadelphia. And then from 58 to 1860, he was in Richmond at the Marshall Theater. Um, And here he took better roles. And here also, I think, interestingly enough, he formed the acquaintance of many uh, Virginians who who, who lived in the future Confederate's capital city. Uh, He also uh, worked for John T. Ford there. So that formed the first link Uh, connecting those two men, Ford and Booth, whose names, of course, will be forever connected. Uh, Late in 1860, early in 61, when the nation was falling apart in the secession crisis, Booth was um, beginning to make his first efforts to start him, but he really didn't become a star, I would say, until uh, the war was underway in 1862. One of the plays that helped him establish his reputation was a play called The Marble Heart. In fact, it became a signature play for him and one of his most successful In its time, The Marble Heart was called a romantic um, drama or an emotional drama. The central character was a sculptor named Raphael. And this role offered a bit of challenge for Booth because Raphael has no dramatic situations uh, to stew in. He has no great speeches to give. It's it's a role that demands uh, from Booth or any actor an ability to portray wild, hopeless, self-consuming passion um, uh, somebody to get out there and really chew up, uh, chew up the scenery. And, of course, Booth was certainly able to do that. The Marble Heart is set in Paris, in and around Paris, in 1864. I- I'm sorry, in 1854. And it's a story of unrequited love. Raphael was a sculptor, uh, a young artist, as I mentioned. He was happy, successful, seemingly on the verge of great things. When he fell head over heels in love with the beautiful uh, Mademoiselle Marco. Uh, He's an artist, he loves the beautiful, and the beautiful has arrived. He is just enchanted with her. He is enraptured with her. He loses interest in everything. He loses interest in his art. He neglects his friends. He ignores his mother. Um, And just follows her about, buys her from his very modest income, buys her gifts, um, and so forth. But unfortunately... Raphael can't see beyond the end of his Van Dyke beard. He can't see that this confection, as lovely as she is, is cold, proud, and materialistic. He has loved well, but not too wisely. Now, all the time, uh, Raphael is ignoring a little treasure right at hand, and this was the devoted Marie. Marie was a virtuous orphan, rustic charm and beauty. She was, as one of Raphael's friends uh, said, Eve before apple season. I think that's the best line in the whole play for some reason. Yeah, she's wonderful, simple, charming, and evil for apple season. So what would it be for Raphael? Would it be honest love and gingham, or would it be vanity and greed and silk and satin? In other words, obviously the classic male dilemma. The classic male dilemma. Ginger or Marianne? (laughs) Seems to me. Now, Marco encouraged... Uh, Raphael's attention, as long as he had some money. Then as soon as he ran out, she dropped him. Um, this, it's like one of the secretaries in our office is fond of saying when she talks about her boyfriends, uh, she always says, no romance without finance. <laughs> and I think that's what's going on here. Uh, M- Mademoiselle Marco becomes engaged to Monsieur Vadur, 
who is a wealthy man, but uh, kind of worthless. Regrettably, if Marco has a marble heart, and that's the title of the play comes from, Raphael has a marble head. He just won't give up. He pleads for her love. He begs. He cries. He gets on his knees. He debases himself. She simply laughs in his face. She explains to him that she has been poor once before, and she will never, never be poor again. Obviously, uh, Marco agrees with, with the J. Paul Getty's observation uh, when Getty said, the, the, the meek shall inherit the earth, but they don't get the mineral rights. They don't get the mineral rights. So that's the problem with them. Now, only too late does Raphael discover what an idiot he's been. He's been loving an undeserving woman, so he returns home after months of uh, fruitless courtship to discover that his mother has died out of neglect. In fact, she died on her birthday, sitting at a window day and night, looking down a road along which she would sure he would come to pass, and of course it never happened until it was too late. Raphael is driven mad by his guilt. His noble soul descends into madness, and he, and he dies. Now, emotions run pretty raw in this drama, and when it was properly played, as you might guess, it was almost painful to look at, uh, to see all this agony on the stage. I, I admit that the plot sounds contrived and mawkish to us today, but it wrung tears from the audience in 1863. You better bring a handkerchief when you came to see this thing, but you need it. But in a mere 25 years, it produced laughter in the audience. It just seemed overly sentimental and um, old-fashioned. Nevertheless, the Marble Heart had its day, and in fact, the phrase Marble Heart entered the English language, and you can see it often in the late 19th century. I saw something in the Boston Globe not long ago, just ran across it. It was a list of superstitions, and one of them was if a young man went to see his girlfriend and he stubbed his right toe, uh, she would uh, receive him well and he would be welcome. If he stubbed his left toe, the paper said he would get the marble heart treatment uh, from, from the woman. Or a similar story I saw, I think, in a Chicago paper. Uh, a young man went to see a sweetheart. He wanted to propose marriage. And his intended said, well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, men are so fickle, uh, the young woman said. At first, love is a fierce flame. Then gradually, the frame grows lower and lower, perhaps dying out altogether. Uh, a man will lose sight of the sweet things of life, the the little trifling endearments that mean so much uh, to a young girl like myself. Um, you'll forget about me and devote yourself to other things like, oh, like your business, for example. The young man said, no, no, that will never happen with me, dearest. The young woman said, I, I don't know. It, it would be great for a year, perhaps two, but then for you it would be, be all account books and, and balance sheets and accounts receivable and so forth. Never, never, I'll, I'll never go that way, the young man said. The young woman said, let me understand. Are you saying that that will always be so, that you will consider me before anything like business, for example? Absolutely, my darling, the young man said. Rising to her feet, she said curtly, then we can never wed. The man I marry must double his income every two years. <laughs> okay, there's the marble heart for you. Now, it's funny, if you start looking around, I, I just ran across it. In Appleton, Wisconsin, the uh, bachelors of the town formed an anti-marble heart club. They promised not to marry uh, any materialistic woman, and uh, they called themselves the Marble Hearts. They actually wore little marble hearts around on their lapel. Abraham Lincoln, as we know, was a great fan of the theater. William Sin of Washington's New National, also called Grover's Theater, wrote, Lincoln was a great admirer of the drama and was particularly fond of comedy. When very prominent actors appeared in whom he was personally interested, Lincoln would invite them to his private box between acts and they would have a chat. He never had the least desire, as many theaters do, to go behind the scenes, however. Sin said, uh, Lincoln said that that would spoil the illusion if he, if he did that. A number of these actors, interestingly enough, that Lincoln met and chatted with had very strong connections to John Wilkes Booth. Maggie Mitchell was a wonderful actor who delighted Lincoln with her singing, dancing, and acting. Lincoln even sent the White House carriage around to fetch her and bring her to the mansion for a talk. At the very time this happened, this is the mid-war years, uh, Maggie was engaged in a torrid affair with John Wilkes Booth. Um, they were so hot and heavy, as a matter of fact, that the Ford family of Ford's Theater thought they were engaged. Edwin Booth entertained Lincoln with a number of plays. This is John's brother. Uh, Hamlet, Lincoln saw, The Merchant of Venice also, and Secretary of State Seward uh, threw a dinner for Edwin at his home on Lafayette Square. 
John's other older brother, Junius, Brutus Booth Jr., entertained Lincoln with the Merchant of Venice, and John's brother-in-law, John S. Clark, uh, entertained Lincoln and Grant and Burnside, who came to a play at Ford's Theater early in 1865. So you can see the uh, Lincoln saw quite a few of the Booth family members, including John Wilkes. It's obvious that Lincoln loved the stage and had great appreciation for its art and artist. Given the, his delight in the theater, can anything be sillier than the following comment from a, a minister in Brooklyn who said, it cannot be said that Lincoln enjoyed going to the theater. He went there with great reluctance. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, uh, how he got that idea. Now, as I said, Abraham Lincoln saw John Wilkes Booth perform in a, The Marble Heart in 1863. This is not the only time that Lincoln saw Booth perform. Leonard Grover, who's manager of the uh, Washington Theater mentioned earlier, wrote that President Lincoln attended several Booth plays and moreover that Lincoln admired Booth's acting. John T. Ford says the same thing. Uh, in a manuscript note, which uh, I found at the Maryland Historical Society, Ford wrote, Booth was a particularly fascinating person to everyone who knew him. Even his distinguished victim expressed admiration of him. Ford then had second thoughts about the phrasing expressed admiration and went back and struck it out and wrote the words admired him in some respects. A little editing there. According to one account, Lincoln went to see Booth play the role in the historical drama Richelieu. In Act Two, Booth's Richelieu is faced with an impending dynastic struggle and civil war. The character declares, Richelieu declares, the pen is mightier than the sword. This is the play from which that sentence, in which that sentence first appears. The pen is mightier than the sword. Behold the arch enchanter's wand, said Richelieu holding up a pen, in itself nothing, but taking sorcery from a master's hand, it can paralyze Caesars and strike the world breathless. Then, this account declares, Booth looked directly at Lincoln and continued with the following text from the play. Take away the sword. States can be saved without it. There was a second of quiet in the theater as the audience grasped what Booth had just said and to whom he said it. And then the bourbons from Pitt the Dome uh, began cheering and clapping. Mr. Lincoln sat quietly on looking at their display. The account continues that Lincoln later expressed displeasure over this incident to actor Edwin Forrest. And Forrest informed Lincoln that he would respond to the outrage by giving a nationalist reading of the same lines at his first opportunity. Now, this is typical of a number of stories about Booth and Lincoln in the post-war years. The incident simply never happened. Booth never played Richelieu in Washington, D.C. Moreover, the same story is told about a half a dozen actors, all of whom used the same lines from the same play to score a point on Lincoln's presence. Anyway, it is very unlikely Lincoln would have opened up like that to Edwin Forrest, who was a noted Democrat, a McClellan a fan, and a person who felt the Civil War was an attack upon constitution, constitutional liberties. George Alfred Townsend wrote that Lincoln did wish to meet Booth after a performance. Townsend was a journalist who knew a great deal about John Wilkes Booth, and he said, Mr. Lincoln saw Booth play more than once and particularly admired him. He applauded him with that genial heartiness for which Lincoln was distinguished. The president never spoke to Booth, but wished to make his acquaintance and said so. Booth evaded the introduction. Now, actor Frank Mordaunt said, I know President Lincoln admired the man who killed him. In fact, he told me that he wished to meet him, and I said I could easily arrange it. But Booth always had one pretext or the other for avoiding the introduction. Uh, among the times when Lincoln did see Booth, uh, the best documented is a night in November of 1863, and we know this because it's in the diary of John Hay. The play was The Marble Heart. Hay informs us that he was there with Nicolay, Mrs. Lincoln, Lincoln, and other guests. Booth was then at the height of his career. Someone said at that time, if Raphael is indeed a sculptor, he could not have asked for a better model than Booth for the head of Apollo. Booth's eyes were dark but full of expression. His glances were keen, and he read character intuitively. In fact, he exercised a kind of magnetism over many people. No one could resist his fascination. A mass of curling jetty hair crowned his square forehead. When he spoke, his eyes kindled with enthusiasm. His voice thrilled the ear. He was at the very morning of his life. Among the cast on the night of Lincoln's attendance was George DeVere. He was in the play with Booth. And uh, I just mentioned DeVere because he had a very unusual story. DeVere was one of a group of British actors 
who tried to run the blockade into the Confederacy. Uh, they wanted to store in Richmond and other cities. Unfortunately, their ship was captured, and the thespians were sent north. In other words, unable to play before Lincoln, they wound up playing uh, before Davis, rather, Jefferson Davis. Now they wound up playing before Booth, uh, before Lincoln. Certainly, I would say DeVere and his comrades form one of the more unusual cargoes ever netted by the uh, ever-vigilant blockading squadrons of Professor Simon's Navy. Um, the Marble Heart was good entertainment for Lincoln. I, I would think it gave him a break from politics. The play was entirely non-political, with one glaring and kind of, it seems to me, incongruous exception. When Raphael finally confronts the wealthy Vador, his rival, in Act Four, Vador asked sarcastically if he hadn't seen Raphael somewhere before. In fact, Vador continued, wasn't Raphael at the theater recently shedding tears over the fate of poor old Uncle Tom? The words were a slap at Raphael's manhood, but the sculptor held his tongue, and his rival continued, yes, I see I am right. I presume from uh, the order with which you applauded the liberal sentiments of Uncle Tom's cabin that you are in favor of the emancipation of the blacks. Push too far, Booth's Raphael cries, death and dishonor, and moves threateningly toward uh, Vador. The sudden appearance of Mademoiselle Marco, however, pre prevented a fight. Interesting, is it not, that Booth and his characters, Raphael, got a chance to denounce emancipation uh, on the stage of Ford's Theater uh, to Abraham Lincoln. John Hay's verdict on the evening was that it was a rather tame, that was his adjective, tame. Since tame is an adjective few people apply to John Wilkes Booth's performances, one, so, some people have taken this to mean that Booth gave a subdued performance because he was displeased that Lincoln was present. But that could hardly have been the case. There's no way to give a subdued performance of the Marble Heart without offending the entire uh, audience. What they probably meant was this wasn't typical Booth fare. There were no sword fights here. There are no tramping soldiers, no bugle blast, you know, no um, banners. Uh, in other words, in the Marble Heart, Booth looked daggers, but he didn't pull any. And so I guess that's uh, the meaning. Uh, Hay had a poor opinion, I might say, of uh, Booth as an actor. He and Nicolay wrote in their great Lincoln biography that Booth was handsome enough, the pet of his world, as they expressed it, but that his virtue as an actor lay in his good looks rather than any talent he had. Now, most veteran actors and managers disagreed entirely with that. In regard to this, John Ford, and I assume John Ford knows a thing or two about acting, Ford said that Booth's Raphael was simply matchless, simply matchless, his word. Interesting to note, Tad Lincoln also saw John Wilkes Booth play uh, The Marble Heart. Tad loved the make-believe world of the theater, the fancy costumes, the bright scenery, uh, the fairy tinsel captured his attention. He would come to the theater with his father, with his tutor, with friends, or with whoever. And more than once, Tad showed up for a rehearsal. On another occasion, he helped the property men do their chores. Uh, his father indulged Tad's interest even asking the staff at Ford's Theater once to let Tad have a look at the, the technical aspects of their work behind the scenes. Back at the White House, a room was set aside for Tad to erect a miniature theater. This was done. A stage was erected with working gas footlights. I can't, I guess I'm just impressed with the fact they went out of their way to have working gas footlights in this room, and scenery was provided. Artificial flowers and handsome vases were placed on either side of the stage, and decorations included a bust of Edward Baker, the family friend killed at Balls Bluff in 1861. Friends filled out the cast, along with off-duty uh, soldiers from the White House Guard. Grover, the theater manager, provided costumes and any stage bric-a-brac that Tad needed. An area in front of the stage was cordoned off with a wicket fence, settees, couches, sofas were shoved in there for the audience. Uh, Tad's friends, uh, along with White House family and visitors, filled the seats. Of course, Mrs. Lincoln came uh, frequently to the shows, and even the president, as they, said, as they say in Civil War newspapers, um, honored the House with his uh, presence on more than one occasion. Actor John Doyd of Ford's Theater thought Tad could have made a decent actor uh, in time. Uh, be that as it may, I do know that one afternoon, the staff at Grover's noticed Tad and one of the Grover boys setting off down Pennsylvania Avenue. They were dressed in devil costumes, which they had grabbed from the wardrobe department, and were heading downtown, I guess, to frighten or entertain uh, people along the street. 
Now, Tad saw Booth play Raphael in the Marble Heart uh, earlier in 1863, back in uh, the month of April. Tad went to the play with Gus Sherman, a character known in history as the Little Bugler. Gus had immigrated as a small child with his family from Germany, and he grew up in New York City. In 1861, at the war's outset, he enlisted uh, as a musician in the 40th New York Infantry. This is the celebrated Mozart Regiment. Uh, Gus was 12 years old at the time. Gus went on to become a decorated veteran of of 10 battles and served as bugler and orderly to four generals during the war. Tad met Gus in April of 1863 in Falmouth, Virginia, uh, where the Lincolns were present to attend a grand military review. And there in a mass of 60,000 men, Tad spotted Gus, uh, an orderly with the Third Corps. Tad was instantly attracted to the little boy with the sergeant stripes. Gus was older than Tad. Tad was 10, Gus was 14. But Gus looked younger than he was. A photograph of him taken about this time showed um, an undersized kid still retaining a little touch of baby face that certainly belied the incredible experiences, dangers, and hardships that he had underseen. Gus Sherman later said that he, because he could ride well, uh, blow a bugle, beat a drum, and swagger like a veteran, that Tad was fascinated with him, so they spent the day together. And after the review was over, Gus showed Tad how to use a military lance. And all this is very faithfully reported in the next day's New York Herald. Tad demanded that the boy return with the family to Washington, D.C. to be his companion. Oh, no, said President Lincoln. That won't do. This lad is a soldier. He must remain to his duty. Tad howled in protest. And General Sickles, for whom Tad was an orderly, relieved the awkward situation by arranging for Gus to have a two-week furlough. The Lincoln party returned to the White House with Gus in tow. Mrs. Lincoln took him into a bedroom adjoining their own and installed him there. Gus, of course, was absolutely awestruck by the accommodations uh, because Gus said, I've been used to sleeping, as he phrased it, on the soft side of a hard board, and now I'm in one of the White House bedrooms. Tad came in there. The boys began to uh, entertain themselves. In fact, they were so revved up and noisy that at one point Mrs. Lincoln came in and told them to quiet down and go to bed. The president needed his rest, and they were keeping him awake. The boys had a grand time over the next few days. Gus got to be a boy again, which sounds great. Uh, The two of them frolicked around the executive mansion. Once they ran through the president's office, and Gus accidentally bumped a visiting Russian nobleman. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, said Seward uh, in an exasperated tone of voice, don't these boys annoy you? Oh, never mind, said Lincoln good-naturedly. It's a distraction. Gus found Tad to be a generous-hearted, sweet-tempered boy, with an adventurous and an inventive turn of mind. When restless, Tad had a, when restless Tad had a sweet tooth for trouble, I think you could say, uh, on one rainy day when everyone's trapped inside, Tad took a saw, according to Gus, and went to work on, the banister, on a banister in the mansion. <laughs> this mischief was reported to the president, who summoned the culprits to his office. Gus, of course, feared the worst and was surprised when Lincoln did not rebuke Tad. In fact, Lincoln didn't even mention the incident. Rather, Lincoln told the boys a story about his days in the Black Hawk War. It was almost as if Lincoln felt that just by talking to Tad on some interesting topic, he could refocus his attention and redirect his energy. With the help of Mrs. Lincoln, Tad and Gus put on their own play. For an admission of 10 cents, White House staff, standabouts, and soldiers attended their entertainments for the benefit of area military hospitals. The two of them owned the town, as the little bugler put it, so they decided to go to the theater. And on Saturday night, the 18th of April, of the year again, all of this is 1863, they went to Grover's Theater to see the Marble Heart. Booth headed the bill. Grover liked Booth very much. Uh, He had liked him ever since he had seen Booth first act in Petersburg, Virginia, in 1859. At that time, Booth was just a name down the playbill. Grover was a college dropout. Um, taking strolling troops around small provincial towns in Virginia and and living hand-to-mouth. But now, in five or six years, Grover commanded um, one of the leading theaters in Washington. He could have it his own way, and and what he wanted was Booth. I had seen Booth work in the West, Grover wrote, and I regarded him as an exceptional actor. His Richard III has never been equal. His style, in fact, was all fire. 
It has been observed that the 19th century theater was a moral institution, a, not amoral, a skip moral institution. In other words, more regularly than the churches, it preached good values. It, it, in other words, rewarded virtue and it punished evil on stage. Now, what possible moral values or lessons could Tad Lincoln have picked up from John Wilkes Booth and the Marble Heart? Admittedly, there's some, there's some bad stuff there for children. For example, Booth Raphael threw his clothes on the floor and didn't pick them up. Now, every parent here knows that's not right. That's just not right. But there are important positive lessons also for a 10-year-old boy. For example, the play made very clear that if you neglect your mother and you don't visit her on her birthday, she will die. <laughs> Struck by guilt and grief, then you will die. <laughs> but, but on a serious side, how could Ted not have been blown away by Booth's performance? Booth's Raphael, Booth's Raphael ratted, he raved, he shouted, he wept, he shuddered, he tottered, he threatened, he collapsed, he sprang back to life. He argued with invisible people. He laughed maniacally. He ran around on a spooky dark stage. Then he fell dead. There's no sword play there, but a lot of good stuff. The boys, in fact, wondered who Raphael really was, who was, as Gus phrased it, the handsome man with the brilliant eyes. So they looked up Booth's name on the playbill. I'd like to meet that man, said Tad. He makes you thrill. Between acts, the boys went backstage. William Forbes, stage manager, led the pair to the dressing room of John Wilkes Booth. Mr. Booth said, Forbes, this is President Lincoln's son. Gus recalled, and this, these are his words, the actor gave us each a hand with a captivating smile. He continued his makeup, asking us how we liked the play, and we telling him the parts that we most admired. On our leaving, he handed each of us a rose from a bunch that had been presented to him over the footlights. Booth shook hands with us and smiled at us in the most pleasant way imaginable. The rest of the story is uh, all too familiar. Booth murdered Abraham Lincoln in the same theater not many months later. Twelve days in Ford's theater not many months later. Twelve days after doing so, he himself was killed by a Union soldier. Tad Lincoln died at the age of 18 in 1871. Gus returned to the Army. He was on the field of Gettysburg. In fact, he was with General Sickles when that officer was gravely wounded there uh, and helped him um, deal with his injury and get off the field. In 1864, Gus Sherman was dis discharged. The youth had been promised an appointment to West Point by his friends, but that was not to be. Uh, the former Bowery boot black studied hard to qualify, but it had been many years since he had been to school. The war had intervened. Lincoln's death and then his own parents' early demise forced him to go to work for his family. He became a, boot, uh, a bookbinder in New York City. Later, he worked at the Custom House and became active in uh, Republican politics and GAR circles. He attended reunions faithfully, where amusingly enough, he had been so young during the war that most people at the reunion thought he was the son of a veteran, and that happened so often that he just went with the flow. Gus Sherman died in 1905. His uniform and bugle can be seen today. They are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs. Let's let Tad Lincoln have the last word. They come to us through the recollections of Helen Bernard Cole. Helen was a Civil War nurse from Wisconsin. She had seen Lincoln often during the war, and she helped nurse Tad on one or two occasions when he was ill. Cole was with Tad for a time after the assassination. She lived many years after the war, well into the 20th century, but remained touched by her memory of those days. She knew Tad was a little wild, but he was not a bad boy, she thought. He did not have a mean bone in his body. He told Cole he missed his father very much. His father had been so kind. You know, nurse, Tad said to her once, if Pa were alive today, I think he would forgive the man who killed him. Thank you very much. Now, I think I'm... I'm supposed to take some questions, and I'd be glad to do. I, I spoke on a very narrow topic here, I know, but I'd be glad to answer anything or share anything I know about the assassination or the, or the escape or, or, or Booth's life. Are we going to use the microphones again? Is this? Or, uh, thank, uh, thanks. I'll try a question. Thank you. Um, 
It's a little <clears throat> unpleasant to look at it this way, but is it fair to say that by his act, uh, Booth was more consequential to American history than the 10 least important American presidents? <laughs> than the 10 uh, least uh, consequential American pleasant presidents. I don't like to look at it that way, but it, it, would you agree with that? Well, I, I do think that... that uh, I, I think this is the most, what he did was the most consequential murder in American history. I've always thought that. If you, if you look what was coming up in the next few years and President Johnson's difficulties of commanding a political base, which he didn't really have, uh, or uh, getting anything positive done. I mean, the Reconstruction challenges would have been awesome even for Lincoln, but no one in here believes Lincoln would have ever been impeached and I can't believe he couldn't have done better. It, it, was, it was a hell of a thing in that regard, considered after, for sure. Thank you. Terry, uh, Booth is alleged to have said on April 11th, 1865, upon hearing Lincoln deliver his last public address, which, of course, he didn't know was going to be his last public address, that when Lincoln called for black suffrage, at least for those who had served gallantly in the army and those who were very intelligent, Booth allegedly turned to his companions and said, that means nigger citizenship, by God, that's the last speech he's ever going to give. I'm going to run him through. What are the sources for that, and how reliable are they? The source for that is Booth's friend, Lewis Powell, who made the remark to... Uh, one of the investigators when he was in prison. Mm -hmm. And it seems, um, I don't, or, or per perhaps uh, perhaps the remark, let, let me reconsider that. I think that remark was made by um, one of the attorneys uh, in the case, David Harrell, Booth's friend and running companion. His, his attorney is the source for that statement. And I don't doubt that for a second because it's funny about Booth and race. And it's a little complex, but... Uh, he seems to have grown more and more focused on it at the end of the war. And it was almost like that African Americans could not achieve their freedom without him losing his. I mean, he's not, he's more typical than, than exceptional in his racial views. But by the end of the war, right, he was becoming increasingly focused on this, on this one issue, the changes, uh, positive changes that the war had brought for African Americans. So I don't doubt that he said that a bit. That's, that fits right in with everything else that he was saying, that people at Ford's Theater heard and so forth. I feel very good about that sentence. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, it was interesting. Uh, naturally, they were, uh, I don't think any of the family knew what he was planning to do. I'm sure they didn't, and they were horrified. His younger brother was en route from California on a ship. And he was detained when he got to New York City, questioned. He didn't know anything. In fact, Joe, poor old Joe, didn't even know his own age. Uh, he, was, <laughs> maybe he was so frightened by what he was getting into. He wasn't able to give straight answers, but he didn't know anything. Um, older brother Junius was in Cincinnati where he was lucky to escape a mob and get back to Philadelphia where he joined Booth's sister, Asia, in her uh, home. And that was also where um, the mother, Booth, who was in New York, came down to stay because Asia was in the middle of a demanding pregnancy with twins. Uh, Edwin was in Boston performing. He got back to New York City. So the family was was in, in, in real trouble. Junius and Clark were arrested and kept for a number of weeks. Joe questioned and released. Edwin was brought to Washington, D.C. when it was thought his testimony might be needed, but then they decided they didn't, so he was uh, sent back. He was rather publicly unionist, and he had so many friends, even on Grant's staff. Uh, Edwin was well-known uh, as a loyal figure, so he didn't get in much trouble. They all left the stage for about a year. Then they all came back to acting in 66. 
And there are people who don't really like Edwin for one reason or the other that will tell you that the, the murder was the best thing that ever happened in his career because uh, I've seen Cain, now let's go see Abel, right? I mean, that this, is a, <laughs> this, is, this is good and a curiosity, you know, track. Let's go see the brother, the guy that killed Lincoln. I know that's hard to say and I, not entirely fair, but they were mortified by the assassination. And that's why when we do go to Green Mile Cemetery in Baltimore, we don't see a separate monument. We don't see a separate marker for Booth. Uh, Edwin just told the keeper of the place to, you know, don't put anything there, leave that unmarked. So everyone in the Green Mile plot has a, a marker except John Wilkes Booth. Uh-huh. I think it did in urban areas and theater areas. Uh, he's certainly the best known assassin we've ever had. I mean, the, the fact that his victim saw him play is strange to think about. I mean, most of the presidential assassins we've never heard of, right? They're, they're nobodies. Uh, he, he's somebody who made money. Uh, people asked for his autograph. Uh, this one account, which may be true, I'm still thinking about how to make a decision on it. He's the first actor to have his clothes torn by uh, adoring fans. He was so popular in Boston, they had to put police guards at the stage door when he left after performances so he could get out without getting uh, mobbed too much. So his name was very familiar. And I think it was help, obviously, by the fact that his father had been a very famous actor, and his older brothers had also uh, brought the name before the public. So it was a name, it, it resonated. Pe- people had a pretty quick idea who he was, or, he, or knew him already. Uh-huh. Um, in, in terms of the uh, conspiracy aspects of the assassination, um, what, uh, how did he relate to the other conspirators? I mean, it seems uh, if he's kind of a renegade or might have been a, more of a leader in it, I'm not sure how that's interpreted in terms of what we know about the conspiracy aspects of it. There are a couple of different opinions. One, that his conspiracy was plugged into a larger Confederate uh, attack on Lincoln. Others, that he was more of a freelance person and just summoned up some congenial spirits. That, you, know, you look around Baltimore or Washington enough, you'll find disgruntled people, ex-Confederates, people who would fall under his magnetic influence. Um, and I incline to the latter view. Uh, there were other plots against Lincoln, but I sort of inclined to the view that, that what they did was kind of a um, uh, almost a, a freelance entrepreneurial uh, plot of young Marylanders. And um, he, I think, just got these people either because of their political beliefs or their friendships. Uh, they had been former schoolmates of his. Uh, he prevailed. He tried to get actors to help him. He went back to his hometown of Bel Air and talked to people there about coming into the plot. So he, several people said he is really the engine of the whole thing. There are a lot of other people involved, but as one of his co-Confederates, Samuel Arnold, said, Booth really alone was the driving spirit. He was the one that drove this whole thing forward, first the kidnapping plot and and then the assassination. I just got a notice here. very grateful for the questions, but this program is being recorded, so they want you, please use the microphones that are on either side there, so they can get the question really nicely. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Booth went to Canada, did he not, or at least he claimed to? Yes. And I guess he came back and told the, his fellow conspirators that he had met uh, with uh, Southern spies in Canada, and uh, he indicated to them that he had their approval, but uh, is it possible that he just went up there, identified himself, and they sort of gave him a cold shoulder, and yet he came back and made the claim that he had was a part of a conspiracy? I mean, it makes a difference if one was a part of a, a you know, a spur of the minute conspiracy and, uh, you know, a you know, very large, involved uh, plot. 
Well, he did go to Canada, where he met with a number of people from Maryland, Baltimore people who were in exile up there doing business. And he did meet with uh, George Sanders, uh, one of the more radical Confederate exiles up in Canada, who had been involved in plots against Napoleon III in the 1850s. But as everybody got close enough to those people, admitted they had no idea. They saw him talking, but they don't know what they were talking about. And I, it, it, it makes sense that if you could get Confederate support, official Confederate support, that that put kind of an imprimatur on what you're doing. At the same time, they don't show evidence of a lot of connections with the Confederate government because they're broke all the time. They, they're, they're out of money. The Booth kind of bankrolled the whole thing uh, out of his own uh, pocket. And the conspirators often said, you know, we're dressing in rags. We don't have the money to do this. Um, this doesn't show like, it doesn't look like it's being endowed by the Confederate government in Canada. But I, I kind of like what Booth's acquaintance, George Alfred Townsend, said. Booth knew them up there, and they patted him on the head. I think that's maybe the best thing that you could say, that some of them probably knew what he was doing. It's interesting how many people did have some idea of what he was doing, and he just didn't say anything or didn't, or kept their mouth shut or thought, oh, that's John, you know, what will it be next week? Uh, that they didn't take him seriously. I have two questions. One is, uh, can you speak to the missing pages in Booth's diary, and if you have any explanation for that? And the second one is, is it true that his last words were useless, useless, as it relates to his hands because he was paralyzed? Yes, his last words were useless. It's very hard to hear what he was saying when he died. He was really gasping, and everything he said, he, he, he didn't really say anything at the end. Almost everything he said was in the first 30, 45 minutes while he lingered several hours. So any last words he said, he didn't say in full over dead. He said a considerably long time before he actually died. And it was very difficult. You had to sometimes put your ear right down on his mouth to understand what he was saying. There have been a lot of interpretations about what that means. Of course, it's, it's tempting to say he was making a commentary on his act, on his life, but it's also somebody there, I just looked at this material fairly recently, somebody there said they offered him some water and he said that was useless. So somebody else said that was a comment on his running mate, Harold, who, uh, had, who was tied up in a tree in the yard near, near where Booth was standing. So it's anybody's guess what that was. Uh, there are missing pages from Booth's diary, that's true. Uh, but it's not 18, it's more than 18. We know that Booth used the pages of the diary to uh, write little notes to people. I know twice in my research I found out that uh, he was talking to somebody and they, they gave him his address and he wrote that in the diary. Uh, those pages aren't there now. So I know some pages are missing, but several of the pages that I know are missing are either accounted for or they're totally unsuspicious. What I think he had was he had a little, he didn't really keep a diary. Exactly. You know, he, he kept kind of a journal, uh, but only after the assassination. He, he, he had a little book. He just kind of kept business notes in it, memoranda, you know, kind of day book type things. Uh, but then on the run, when he began to chronicle his thoughts, uh, he did tear some pages out, I think. And I think, you know, after looking at the original and, and everything and thinking about this and reading all the sources, it seems to me what he did was so that what he was writing on his escape, where he attempts to justify the assassination, that's very important to him. So he just tore out the extraneous pages around it, because you don't want the, the page right across from it to say, you know, meet Nellie at 8.30 at the Star Hotel. I mean, that, that's, so, you know, he's trying to kind of dress it up. I give it that interpretation. In the book, The Mad Booths of Maryland, the author states that Booth had a number of voice problems in the last year of his life, and that he either canceled or was being canceled in uh, appearances. And the author sort of then suggested that this had added to uh, some kind of frustration within Booth, which uh, then uh, fueled his general anger and uh, helped, therefore, contribute to his act. Uh, do you have any information about that? That's a neat theory. 
Um, the, and I considered that. The, one of the problems is that his family doesn't seem to be aware of that. Uh, they all seem to think he had a real future in front of him. I do know he seems to be having some recurrent bronchitis problems. Um, but most of the sources I see, do, they don't, I see some references to that. Uh, and conditions in those old theaters were awful. I mean, they could be drafty, right? And then, um, you know, you, you're wearing your voice out. There's, there's none of this to help out. So I, I think probably more interesting is when Booth began to speculate in oil in western Pennsylvania in 1864. That almost indicates to me that he's, he's not losing interest in acting, but, but, but he's... Maybe he is, right? Maybe he's, he's thinking about other ways to make money, ways that, that involve less travel, uh, less stress, um, ways it might be easier to, 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 ways to make a living. Uh, I know he was interested in business affairs. He owned stock. You know, he bought city lots. Uh, he bought U.S. bonds, which is interesting, right? He didn't buy Confederate bonds. He bought U.S. bonds. <laughs> So as I like to say, crazy, but no fool. <laughs> so I guess that's a, uh, still a little bit of an open question. But I think he was having, he's having some problems. But I don't think not enough to drive him from the stage. Because all of his friends thought he was fine. His acting friends and his family thought he had a great career in front of him. What were the connections between Booth and doc, Dr. Mudd? It's amazing how many people in Charles County, Maryland, knew that Lincoln was to be kidnapped. In fact, one reporter said that so many people in Charles County who knew what was about to happen to Lincoln, or what they hoped would happen to Lincoln, said it, it's easier to, this guy said, it's easier to find people who didn't know. You know, you could just arrest the county and excuse about a dozen, uh, right? But... Mud lived down in this Charles County area through which Booth would pass, and it seems to me, it, it seems pretty, pretty plain and commonsensical that Dr. Mud was aware of the kidnap plot and made important introductions um, to people who were not just sympathizers, but people like Thomas Harbin, Confederate spy, John Surratt, Confederate courier, who were uh, a, even at a deeper level of opposition to the government. Um, so Mud was a real facilitator. But I think Mud. Booth was kind of pushy, and Mudd was kind of petulant as a personality. So they didn't kind of jive as individuals. Uh, I think Mudd's great problem was that uh, when Booth came to his house after the assassination, Mudd became an accessory after the fact. And um, Mudd let Booth take off when there were soldiers nearby in town who could have arrested him. And I think I would have too. I mean, Booth's in your house with your wife and four kids. Uh, you can't host a shootout on the parlor steps. I mean, that's uh, just crazy, and I, I don't fall Dr. Mudd for what he did. But even his own lawyer said that Mudd wasn't really straight with anybody, even them, and it made it very difficult to defend him. The broken leg, the fall off the horse or the jump to the stage? And if it's a jump to the stage, how can you, with a broken leg, put that broken leg in a stirrup, put your whole weight on it, and swing up onto a horse? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, the, um, the, it seems to me there's no doubt that when, when you look at the two, both rode both horses. Uh, at one point during the escape. And when they, got, when they were examined at Dr. Mudd's the next morning, they both looked pretty beat up. You had chunks of skin out of them, were lame in the four legs and stuff. That doesn't preclude something happened to the horses. But I, I'm, I feel convinced um, that Booth broke his leg at the theater. Uh, he says so. He told people he trusted that's where he broke it. Uh, that story was known in Washington before Dr. Mudd or anybody ever told anything about the break. Uh, he broke the small bone right in his left leg, which is not a weight-bearing bone. So you can move on that. It's, it's painful, but with the adrenaline going, you know, and the surprise he had of what he was doing, he, I see him getting across the stage. There's only one account. He rode uh, with the leg out of the stirrup, apparently. 
And there's an account of that from Thomas Harbin, the Confederate spy whom he met in, uh, in Virginia when he got over. And he said Booth was able to do this because he was exceedingly strong. And he said, uh, Harbin said, I saw him get up uh, and get to a spot uh, on a stone wall and then just kind of swing himself into the saddle and left his leg out. But that makes, that would, perhaps if that's what really happened, that would make sense in explaining why, you know, Booth didn't take one of the carbines from the Surratt house because Booth told John Lloyd, who ran the Surratt house, I need both of my hands to hold on to this horse. I can't, I can't hold on to anything else. So I'm, I'm uh, the opinion that he did break his leg at the theater. He says so. And I don't see why he, in his diary, and I don't see why he would lie about that. Uh, now, somebody said, well, he had a great reputation as a horseman, and so he didn't want to admit that he had fallen on a horse. And I, I think, yes, he, he was a good rider and had a great reputation as a horseman. But in a document like that, which reputation was he most interested in? His reputation as a horseman or his reputation as America's Brutus? In other words, you know, at the very moment when he's doing what he's fantasized about for years, he screws it up. He breaks his leg you know, in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. So in some ways, putting that in showed a rugged honesty on his part. But he, funny, I'll just tell you the story. It hasn't been in any book, and I'm going to stick it in mind. Booth did love horses. And when he was up in the Pennsylvania oil country, uh, he saw a teamster uh, with a big load of wagons going along the road, whacking on a horse who looked too old and tired to pull this load. Booth jumped up on the wagon, grabbed the whip from that guy, and said, let's see how you like that. And he whacked the guy a couple of times with the whip started whacking on this teamster, saying, let's see how you like being beat like that. So Booth is an interesting character, right? You find a lot of little stories like that, uh, trying to bring them together in the book and put them in some context. Question. Yes. What I, I'm pretty ignorant about Booth, but uh, it seems, did he do anything prior to, to murdering Lincoln? I mean, during the Civil War, what was his role? Did he join the Confederate Army? Did he enlist in their spy service? I mean, what did he do besides jump out and shoot Lincoln? To the consternation of his Virginia friends, he did not enlist in the Confederate Army. Well, he's kind of a uh, cowardly figure. Well, that coward, coward, you know, the, the very act, there's something cowardly about the act of assassination. I mean, you're attacking someone who can't defend themselves, you're attacking from concealment. So, you know, it, it was said in 65 that no one who's assassinated by definition and it can be a brave person, but the problem with that is everyone who knew this guy knew he was uh, brave to the point of reckless. I mean, his, his instinct and in time of danger was to charge it head on. And so the explanation about not going to the Army is something else. I think, and it sounds maybe trite, but probably half the room has heard it before, but you know, his mother, he was incredibly devoted to her, and I think if you remember what it, among his last words were, right, tell my mother I died for my country, that she was on his mind even at the end of his life. Um, his brother Junius was in California. His brother Edwin and Clark, were going. the brother-in-law, were going to um, England. His younger brother Joe was going to England, and then he went to Australia during the war. So there wasn't anybody really on the East Coast here for the mother except him. She had always had a premonition that he would die in a war of some kind, and she began to just you know, frantically pressure him, according to John T. Ford, frantically pressure him in the spring of 61 not to get involved in the war, not to take sides, and he, and he made a promise, and I think that was a promise that went against his nature. Uh, you know, his nature was to go into this service and... Um, you know, he, he, t he said, you're no Roman mother, you know. And, and she says, I can't help it, you know. I, I can't lose any more children. And it was a promise he made, but as he told his brother, one of his brothers, he, he regretted making that. As the war went on, he regretted it more and more. As long as the South was winning or at least not losing, you know, he felt all right about it. But when the South began to lose, it began to eat into him. And he you know, began to push forward this idea of abducting Lincoln. He did a little bit of drug smuggling, a little bit of mail running, but uh, most of his military political activities were focused from August of 64 on, on the abduction of Lincoln. Okay, let's take a 